Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second of our series of podcasts addressing diversity and inclusion in the workspace. The reaction to the first webcast was phenomenal, and it sparked some fantastic debate. And I hope that we project today. Our intention is not to drive a policy debate here, but to share our personal views from a range of the amazing, diverse, talented leaders that I have on this panel today. I'm in awe of all of all of them. For all of us on the panel, we have experienced how to deal with microaggressions or call them out in some form or the other. So today we're going to take a closer look at these microaggressions, the impact that they've had on us, the performance of the firms we work with and for. As you saw from the quotes, Kevin Nadal summed it up beautifully, saying microaggressions are the everyday, subtle, intentional, or sometimes often not intentional interactions or behaviors that communicate some sort of bias towards historically marginalized groups. So it's likely at some point that all of us on this call would have experienced, witnessed, and encountered microaggressions. Not all of us feel comfortable with dealing with them, challenging them, and helping change those behaviors. So today we're going to have some ideas, tools, tips about how we can collectively do this in our our work. Let's let's get you involved. Let's think about a quick question. So, do you believe? Do you believe microaggressions in the workplace are predominantly conscious or unconscious? We have five answers. I'm anxious to hear all of these. And whilst we wait for these answers, let me introduce who is on the panel today. Absolutely fantastic panel. I'm going to start with Laura. Laura co-founder and chief customer officer of Contexer. I mean, it's amazing, 16 years experience and you've been using innovative technology, emerging technology, but you're not using it just, you're using it to solve real problems. You're empowering organizations, corporates and clients to make those decisions from their data. And I believe, I mean, this is so exciting. You pioneered the contextual monitoring approach to trader surveillance, which is used industry-wide today. Welcome, Laura, delighted to have you on. Can't wait to hear your views. We then have Trebeni Tukli, and she is the director of sustainability. Now, Trebeni is a force to be reckoned with. 20 years experience in technology across many sectors, many geographies, she lives this day to day. So Trebeni, I understand you're passionate about inclusion of diversity, but you just don't talk the talk. You, are, you have set up amazingly STEM bursaries for girls from disadvantaged backgrounds with Kendrick School in Reading. And you personally mentor all of the recipients of this. That's great. Trebeni, can't wait to hear you, you either. So, but Laura Trebeni, who else can we have? So I'm so privileged because the next person, Ralph Inelli, is a personal friend of mine. I worked with her for many years. And Ralph, again, has massive, she's an amazing sales leader, business development. She's the EMEA Alliance leader for ServiceNow. And she's experienced in growing those alliances across technology corporations and with consulting firms such as ours. And last, Ralph, can't wait to chat with you. I hope you're going to be your open, normal self. And then last but not least, we have Renier. Now, Renier he is our transformation leader for the Netherlands, but he's also led, uh, you know, talk, driving this data-driven digital transformation. But on the other side, Renier has been instrumental, pivotal, and has led the diversity and inclusion agenda across consulting in the Netherlands. Renier, Great to have you here and can't wait to hear your views. But do you, should we now, but thanks everyone, looking forward to this, let's look, let's look at the first slate. First polling question. Okay, predominantly unconscious. To me, that's good, right? Because if people are not aware, we can fix it. The second thing, unconscious, but if noted, no action is taken. And I think here today, all of us collectively can make some commitments, get some ideas to change that. But I'm going to jump straight into 
the next piece. We're going to pick all of this up. As we move through this session, this is really meant to be time for you to be able to ask some questions. We have a very open panel. You're going to pick them up as we go along. Personal and then the organizational. And if it's OK, I'm going to start with the personal experiences and insights into microaggression. If you're OK, Trubeni, may I start with you? A tremendous role model, phenomenal leader in a very, very tough industry. Have you been impacted by microaggressions during your career? And if so, Trubeni, how have you dealt with this? First of all, uh, thank you so much for having me in this panel to talk about this very important and yet quite widely overlooked panel, uh, you know, topic uh, of conversation in the workplace. Um, Microaggression is like a slow poison. To me, it starts uh, diminishing someone's psychological safety to an extent that in the extreme case, it can cause a complete exclusion for an individual and defeating the whole purpose of the diversity workforce. In my career, I have uh, experienced microaggression uh, on quite a few occasions. Some of it has been due to my gender and some due to my ethnicity. I would like to share uh, two examples uh, from uh, the instances. One of them was quite early on in my career where I was part of this team and I was the only female in the team. And, you know, we used to run a monthly event in terms of, you know, a day long agenda on very exciting topics around agile transformation or you know digital transformation in the workplace those kind and every time you know the agenda would come up and i get involved in the conversation i'm already you know racing in my head with which topic uh, subtopic i would like to coordinate and arrange etc only to find that my name always got put in against the catering requirements for the day that happened a few times and you know me being me in the cultural orientation that i had i felt like okay seniors have made the decision and i can only obey and so i would keep quiet i kept quiet for a few of those uh, occurrences never feeling comfortable with how i felt uh, being overlooked in terms of you know being able to do something else and then i realized that if i do not speak up not only am I not respecting myself or owning that space, but I'm actually not breaking the chain. And therefore, eventually, I mustered some courage to raise for the first time that, you know, I would like to do something else uh, in from the agenda rather than catering, because I felt that I needed to show that females are there or I'm part of the team on the basis of my intellectual capabilities, not just purely as a female. And so that was my first act of courage in voicing it. And for me, taking that forward was important in terms of breaking that cycle. The second one that I got uh, to hear quite a few times uh, was during my early years uh, in the UK after I arrived here. And the statement used to be, your English is quite good. Now, the first time I heard that, I, I felt pleased. Actually, in my head, I was like, oh, my parents, you know, uh, made a lot of effort to put me into an English medium school. And therefore, you know, the rewards are coming in now. And, you know, language is not a barrier. So that's great. However, on reflection, I started realizing and felt that, hey, here was a perception that others from my fraternity and community could not speak fluent English. And I started feeling much less comfortable about that statement and what was being said. Again, it wasn't something that I could, you know, voice my opinion uh, immediately about it. But eventually I I wanted to probe this further. So I started exploring in the conversation 
with the individuals who made that comment. What was interesting is when I asked them, you know, is it that they've encountered others not being, other Indians not being able to speak fluent English? Many of them had actually not spoken to anybody else from my uh, country. And it was based on hearsay. So here was a perception that was building up, not only on their direct experience, but a hearsay, and I could see that stereotype. And I also got comments in terms of, you know, how is it my responsibility to correct that? And I felt like it's not about a responsibility. It's about raising that awareness that you are saying something, but are you mindful of what you're saying because of how it can come across? especially if it is not from your own experiences, you know? So that is how I, I reacted to these two microaggressions. And I'm glad it took me, uh, you know, a couple of instances of occurrence of those to kind of, you know, find my voice. But I think it is important because the chain needs to be broken, especially when, you know, not everybody's aware of the impact of what they say. And some of them were very apologetic when they heard I me mean, challenging them because you know they didn't realize the impact about it. Back to you, Priya. I love that. I, I, I took away that the courage to break the cycle and explore the perception. That in itself is something that I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna pick that up myself. But thank you so much for sharing that. I mean I, I can I can I can relate to some of that, but we can we can pick that up a bit later. I'm just going to go to Ralph, if you don't mind, Ralph, picking up and c continuing that thread that Trebeni picked up. Do you believe microaggressions have held either yourself back or any of your colleagues in the workplace? Thank you, Priya. Hello, everybody. Wonderful to join you today. And actually thinking about coming on today, it really uh, took me down memory lane. Um, really, really had um, some great thinking uh, ahead of this. So in my case, uh, mainly no, but uh, definitely yes, sometimes. And I believe that over a number of years, it could have made me even stronger. So my journey experiences mainly were smooth, but sometimes quite uh, bumpy. Uh, but ha it had me readily understand what and who the priorities were from a business perspective and ultimately what I needed to deliver, achieve for my employer, my partners, and most of all my customers, but also where I needed to focus specifically to grow and shape myself as an individual and ultimately create the life that uh, I wanted. Upsetting or disappointing as some situations were in my case, I stayed on course and focused on my assignment and the outcomes, obviously, I wanted to deliver. I, I was supposed to be a lawyer, actually, and I ended up in technology thanks to a summer job during my last year in university. A lovely lady in the industry eventually convinced me a few years later to go into sales. Never thought in a million um, years I would end up in sales. And you may have guessed that the summer job did lead to a full-time role in this sector. Um, I was surrounded by very talented teammates who leaned in to teach me everything I needed to know to then, uh, at the time, become a junior network operations manager. It was a, quite a diverse and all-male unit, um, and one extraordinary female, my good friend to this day, by the way, um, and if she was with us today, she would not hesitate to tell you how she was worried uh, a lot, by the way, how I would cope working in an often tough environment. Trust me, I had my moments. I also watched others uh, also have their moments. Um, with each early but big decision in my little world, I always ask myself, why am I doing this? Should I remain in this sector? And most of all, how do I just not survive here? I want to thrive and I want to thrive for a long time. The journey over the years, and, and still, by the way, was incredible. And I know now I was very fortunate to have landed within this sector and varying, varying capabilities. Um, it did include moments of uncomfortable conversations, slapstick commentary, uh, being seen, but not always being heard. Um, woven into my experience living within this sector, I was able to overcome several obstacles and hurdles uh, just thrust and placed in front of me, including benchmarking sales targets that I had to achieve. Um, I was in it for the long haul though, and um, trying to win every day, one day at a time. 
As I made my rounds over the years, it was ultimately key for me to be judged for my merits, nothing more. It's interesting, recently I was having a, a very ad hoc conversation with someone who I hold in the highest regard. We were discussing simply selling as a general topic. In, in a very humble tone in, in our conversation, I mentioned that I had never missed a sales target from a career standpoint. And his reply to me was, um, it, really, it, really, it really set me aback. He said, well, you missed out on learning what you um, had to do to rally around missing a target and how to recover from it. Um, and, you know, you probably met all your targets because that was uh, due to luck. You, you had really low targets. I was really surprised. So I made the decision um, in this conversation not to counter with my commentary on, yeah, maybe you're right. I had over 20 years worth of sales targets I had to achieve uh, at the few but very much market leading companies within varying product services and sectors, selling locally, selling globally, living in different countries around the world. Yeah, must have been down to being so lucky then, but I didn't. So what would I tell a colleague or friend if they were experiencing microaggressions of any kind? First of all, discern always what matters to you and how emotional, how much of an emotional tax this is for you. Can you even ignore it? Disarm the person who committed the microaggression, often a conversation. You know, the one that would start with, can I buy you a coffee? Maybe we should have a chat. Calmly challenge them, clarify and verify their statement or their action. This gives people a chance to check themselves and even unpack what made them say what they did. And it gives you an opportunity to better gauge perhaps what their intention was and perhaps tell them that the negative impact, um, you know, what it had on you and, and even the extended team, by the way. Um, and don't be surprised if they are surprised that you confronted them, that they didn't realize that their, their words or their attitudes towards you was affecting you in some way. Some aggravators, I believe, make provocation their sport of choice. If that didn't work, then of course, decide what you want to do with the situation and, and of course with the individual. And if it's really bad, you need to take a more formal step. I watch several mainly female colleagues, but not limited to female, lose confidence in themselves, be affected mentally and even physically. Yes, a few even left the sector altogether, which was really disappointing. They seem to take full responsibility for something that they could not fully control or even understand um, you know, what caused the microaggression. Um, Ultimately, I was taught at a young age and consistently by some incredible mentors and forces in my life and successful in their own right, my mother, my aunt, my godmother, that I would be responsible for validating who I was. And of course, also understanding and coming to terms with what I was not good at. But what also helped along the way was joining a few team sports, baseball and volleyball in my case, industry networks, and most of all, philanthropic work. Health was always and still is a priority. So going to the gym was natural for me. And I went to church. And I love that. It was it was it was a great opportunity to also think um, when, when I was at church and 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 be grateful for what I had um, achieved. Um, so all this other great stuff helped me uh, during the not so fun days, if you will, and and created other supportive outlets. Uh, technology and sales overall within changed my life. Throughout the years, I carried the burden of no matter what came along for the ride um, with my decision to remain within the sector. I had to succeed, but also I found ways to create joy within each role. Back to you, Priya. I love that. Creation of joy, clarify, control, and calm, calmness when you address it. Thanks, Ralph. That was really fantastic. And I'm going to pick on you in a minute around the organizational piece. <laughs> If you figure and a leader at EY, how are you supporting the groups in the technology domain and competencies to prevent microaggression from being present and happening? Thank you, Priya, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, it's a true pleasure and honor to be part of this amazing panel and being in front of so many clients and, and colleagues. And when it comes to microaggression, I've been thinking for a long time that it wasn't part of my own work environment. For me, it was such a topic where you read about, but assume it's not happening in your own environment. Or in case it happened that it was due to clumsiness or silly jokes or being not such a big deal for the people who are involved. 
And by reflecting on the broader diversity agenda over the years and attention for topics like unconscious bias, social styles and inclusiveness, I learned that microaggression is coming forward way more often than I thought before. In my experience, there are quite some different shapes and forms of microaggression. Sometimes it starts re relatively small, for example, come on, she wants to make a career with us, this is how we make office jokes. Or we always have a, a team barbecue with only meat and beer, so everybody will like it this year again. Small examples of unconscious bias playing down the impact of certain behavior or simply forgetting cultural difference. The one I get quite often myself when I meet people for the first time or when I'm standing in an elevator with other people is, wow, you're so tall. How tall are you actually? And as I'm six foot seven, since I'm 16 years old, I'm used to getting these kind of questions, but it still feels to me like being sort of a circus act. One other example that comes to mind was during my time in the UK for EY in 2014. I was working with an exciting mix of different cultures in one team, having someone from Scotland, Australia, India, Greece, and myself from the Netherlands. So quite an interesting cultural mix. And one of my colleagues was traveling back and forth each week to his home country, giving him at least 20 traveling hours a week. And once during the project, he arrived very late at client site after a horrible journey. And I decided to give him some comfort and invited him to have a coffee together. Something I was used to, though in his perspective, that meant he was in big trouble thinking that this was his final warning before he was kicked out of the project because of being late again. Another simple example how misperception causes microaggression. And then coming back to your question, Priya, uh, on, uh, following Raf's uh, points as well, I see some key options to prevent for microaggression, which I've tried to apply over the years. First of all, to me, it's crucial to be curious at all times, really learn to know each other. There is in many cases something unexpected that gives a new perspective and a stronger personal connection. Second, build a trusted environment where people can be themselves, especially in COVID times. It is challenging to create this kind of team intimacy, but Things like lunch walks, digital dinners, and creative remote events have helped me at least to keep the team close together. Thirdly, stimulating an open culture where everybody has an equal voice. That comes with a lot of listening, first of all, actively searching for equal participation, and giving people comfort to speak up when they don't feel involved. And finally, by being a role model, I am seeing it every day with my daughters. The right example behavior is, in my opinion, way stronger than just telling them what's important. Back to you, Priya. That's brilliant. And actually, we had a question come in that was around, do men suffer microaggression? And you answered it beautifully. But I think the thread about having that voice, equality, getting people in a, in a good place, and it's behaviors and actions that, that are going to change that. So thank you. I am going to uh, flip to Laura and then ask her actually to ask answer a question that we've got from the panel. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit, Laura. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask you, uh, how do you manage to be so resilient? You know, you've co-founded this amazing organization. So how have you been so resilient in spite of perhaps seeing these behaviors? That's one for you. And then a Second question, how do we cope with microaggressions that come from other women, colleagues or clients? How, how can, so Laura, over to you. Thanks, Priya. Yeah, so I think, you know, on, on your first question, um, I think some of this I've only learned with age, and that is about being confident in my own abilities. 
you know, I think microaggressions that are something that they do build up over time because they are micro, they're often little pieces that over a period of time, they do start to get you down. And I think they start to make you question whether they're actually true, whether those microaggressions are true. And I think in my younger days, I used to feel that more than perhaps I do today. I think with experience and age, I've become more confident in my own value, my own abilities, and therefore the value that I bring to my own organization and indeed the customers that I work with. So I suppose that's less about stopping the microaggressions, rather focusing on not letting them bother me, annoy me, not uh, allowing them to make me feel like I'm an imposter in, in where I am. Um, and I think, you know, that, that sort of journey that I've been on, I think when I was perhaps a little younger, um, you know, I, my company, we work within in the software world and I'm not in sales, but I'm in sort of customer success and solution engineering. So in meetings, I'm often the person who is articulating the value of the technology and really answering many of the questions that my clients would have. It, when I was maybe 24, 25, uh, you know, I'm... Irish, female. When I was 25, I looked about 14. So I might walk into a room and nobody would understand why I was there, particularly when I went into some of the investment banks. And in those earlier days, before I perhaps had the out and out confidence in myself and my own presence, I would bring someone with me who would perhaps fit the bill of what people were expecting. You know, perhaps they were expecting a, an older, white, uh, perhaps grey-haired man. I would bring that individual with me in the room just to get over those five first five minutes of a meeting where those microaggressions were much. And then with time, as the meeting went on, it became very, very clear that actually I was the expert in the room and that all of those microaggressions seemed to fade away. So I, th I guess my first point in this is about having the confidence in who you are and that those microaggressions that people, people projecting onto you, remember those m microaggressions aren't about you, it's, they're about what other people's interpretation of who you are and what you are and what you can offer. So almost to, to, to a certain degree, set those aside aside and focus on what you are good at and the value you bring. But I think there does come a point in time with all of these that um, we do need to challenge those microaggressions. There will be some aggressions which are very obviously sexist or homophobic or whatever sort of minority group they're against. But so often, and as the poll supported, those, these are subtle unconscious biases that people maybe don't even realise. So the question is, is how do you address those in a positive way? You know, I have seen incidents before where uh, people have become very, very upset about them. And it, it has um, almost uh, become a, a bit like uh, two, two bulls, uh, you know, locking horns over a particular topic. And actually, the more successful way is to have a very open, honest, calm conversation so that people firstly understand that there was a microaggression, there was some sort of unconscious bias there in the first place. And with that honesty and that openness and calmness of addressing it, I tend to find a lot more success um, in, in trying to resolve it. So that, all of that's at a, at a personal level. At, at a company level, you know, as a, as a founder of, one, uh, of this tech company, uh, for me, so much of this is about breeding the right culture and empowering everybody in the organization to know that they can um, they can and should raise issues that they have or feelings that they are exposed to. Um, because it's only through that acknowledgement and realization that it does occur, whether it's intentional or not, can we actually begin to change things. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Laura. And I'm going to that thread about the calmness, contextualizing it, considering it, and dealing with it and not letting other people influence how you how you perceive or how you see yourself or who you are, most importantly, for our audience. Thank you. We're going to move from, we're going to pivot from personal to organization. We've touched on it, being a, a co-founders of Contexter. I'm going to pull up another polling question, if I may. So. Do you think microaggressions go unnoticed in the workplace, ex except by the minority group? 
lovely to understand your answers. And I think I think what listening to what we said whilst people answer this polling question, just to the panel, the common threads that I, I got from you and really fantastic is all around putting things in context, considering when they've been made and how you want to react or deal with them. I love the point around the clarification. So, you know, clarifying, challenging. And Raf, you made the point around disarming somebody so that it's not confrontational, but the challenge is around, you know, getting people to reflect on what they said. And then the piece around the change and the control, you know, controlling how you react to that, Laura, as you said, how you how you deal with it, and then changing those behaviors. Three courage word, which is so important. So I, I, I think that frames so just looking at whether um, what the results are on this, and then we can move into part two around the organizational. Okay, 50-50 on the 39% of us say 50-50, but the majority is saying that they go unnoticed ex except by the minority group. We can take a little bit of time to debate that. But before we do, I'm going to flip into uh, the the organizational piece. And I'm going to go straight into Ralph, if that's OK. Ralph, do microaggressions go unnoticed in the workplace? You heard what the poll said. And what are our learnings for our organizations that you can share? Yes, uh, absolutely. They, they do go unnoticed. I mean, it's tough for an employer. It's tough for an employee. Um, there is offered guidance, of course. Um, can I generalize in saying that uh, we will meet unkind, insensitive, and indifferent people wherever we work, wherever we live or even play? After all, you can't join a company and expect that every single person uh, is going to be nice to you and follow all the rules. A microaggression for one individual may just be another day at the office for another. And, and sometimes I used to say, I just want to do my job. Why does it have to be harder than this? Um, it's different for everyone and perception of what and how something is said and the choice you make to deal with it. Uh, organizations certainly need to be aware if it's a broader cultural issue. Uh, I was reading a few articles in Wired magazine um, this year about a very popular and successful fintech company um, that had some really big and obvious issues uh, like aggression, major aggression across the board within their culture and workplace. And they have chosen publicly to go on record that they are committed to fix their situation, have invested quite a bit to, uh, to repair their workplace. So that's how extreme it even got there. Um, and I've met some outstanding younger talent on the flip side within this sector. They seem so much more aware, so much more prepared, even more resilient. There are better support outlets than there were 15, 20 years ago as well. And microaggression as a theme can have, a, can have varying degrees of impact. Sometimes it's not just the words or actions, it's the tone. And as I think we've mentioned today already, it's who is saying it. It's complex and individual. We can defer the ultimate responsibility to leadership within a company to take action on our behalf, but those that are on the receiving end, as we've said already, um, of those comments or how they're treated uh, on a more consistent basis, especially in extreme uh, situations, situations rather, have such a responsibility to raise it um, uh, as an individual and potentially within their organization. I will admit that even within some extreme situations, I myself did not raise the alarm. I chose to deal with it. It was just right for me at the time. But what I would also try to do is support um, and protect even a colleague who is having to deal with something similar, especially if it was from the same individual. But ultimately, you need to decide how much of an investment is this going to be um, for you? How big is the issue, the individual and your relationship with them? Is it a teammate, a coworker, your manager, or even tougher, as already mentioned, a customer? Um, lastly, I believe that the culture within a company starts from the top. If you have strong and compassionate leadership overall, that's always a good start. Um, it's certainly the type of company I have always tried and chosen to work with. Um, and wherever I have landed and, and where there was a rough arena, I invested in influencing to make the situation and even relationships better. We can all play a small part somehow, 
before things get get or start to become worse. Thanks so much, Raf. Um, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of things that have come through the chat and something that you mentioned. And I'm going to ask Trubeni if it's OK for you to pick this up. We talked a little bit around uh, my, women having microaggressions against other women. And, and we've got a couple of questions coming in about wanting to do a bit of a deeper dive into why this is the case. And Trebeni, if you could pick that up, Ralph, happy for you to join in as well. Sure, Priya. Um, I think, uh, you know, many a times when we look at microaggression, we try to look at it from a single dimension, right? So when you are saying that, okay, there is microaggression by a woman towards another woman, it depends on what the microaggression is about, right? In terms of like where I shared the example of me being picked out around my English or being commented, it was not that always, you know, it was always from a male. So it's the element of intersectionality that we need to look at and understand as to what characteristics is being touched when that microaggression is happening. because. Raf was saying this uh, just now is, you know, it's very complex in terms of, you know, the elements and what defines our identity is complex because of intersectionality, right? I'm a mother, I'm a, a woman of color, you know, I'm someone who's middle-aged. So, you know, there are so many parameters and the microaggression can come as a result of any of them. And I think it, that's why when looking at it just from one lens is not enough to understand why someone experiences a microaggression. Thanks, Trubeni. Anything else to add, Laura, Raf, or, or, or Renier as well? Thanks, Trubeni. That was very comprehensive. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I'd give a little bit of a perspective on that. And, you know, we, in our company, we ran a, um, a panel internally around women in tech and some of the experiences that female employees had. Some of the worst examples were, in fact, from other women. And I don't think as part of that we got to an exact answer as to why. You know, I think there was, uh, you know, there was a question of, for example, if you are in, you know, if you're in a tech company and there are 200 men and there are 10 women, then you are naturally, because of everybody else in the organization, you are naturally grouped together in competition with those people who look like you, i.e. in this case, the other women. So I wonder whether some of it comes about because, you know, if you've got two women who are vaguely in the same area, vaguely in the same role, they will often be compared to one another by management and at promotion meetings and all the rest of it. And therefore, does that breed an unhealthy competition between uh, women that really shouldn't be there when actually, you know, my firm belief is that women should be supporting and uh, encouraging other women uh, and, and, you know, in, in order to really help everybody break through that glass ceiling. So I, I, I guess I don't have a specific answer. It's one theory of mine. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, we're, we're very active when we are doing all of our moderation meetings and promotions that we, you know, when we compare individuals, that we're very careful to make sure that we are comparing people based on the right parameters, not on maybe the more stereotypical parameters that people may have done before. And Laura, could you just uh, summarize what you think is critical at an organizational level? I mean, you, you founded an amazing organization. And so what have you done in that organization to be able to overcome microaggressions? Yeah, I think this comes back to something Raf said earlier. You know, I, I strongly believe that um, the, the tone of a cult company is set from the top, uh, the culture and the tone. And therefore, with the right leadership in place who are committed to, uh, you know, the full breadth of diversity initiatives is absolutely essential. You know, I personally feel very blessed that I have worked with a strong team of individuals since I was a graduate. And it's the same people who I founded this company with. So I, I work with people who have known me as an individual from I was basically a child or certainly fresh out of university, so not far off being a child. Um, and therefore we know each other very well. And we are all very uh, aware of 
the things that are important to each other. So I guess even though we are diverse, you know, we have men of colour, we have white men, we have uh, women. So we've got a, a diverse leadership team there to begin with. Um, but setting that culture and tone from the top, making sure as part of that tone that like, microaggressions or aggressions on any level are totally unacceptable. You know, to me, this is a, it, that there is none of this can be accepted. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, you sack someone for having a microaggression. That doesn't make sense because, as we said before, it often is unconscious. But having the right environment that says that all, all individuals, no matter their race, their gender, their background, their sexuality, whatever, whatever um, perimeter you want, you know, people might identify it as, that in no way contributes to the success of them within an organization. Their success is based on their living up to context of values and delivering on the roles that they've been brought in to do. That is how you are successful. And making sure that everybody is aware of that and that there is a zero tolerance to anything that deviates away from that is point number one. Point number two is about training and education and awareness. So making sure that everybody, you know, we have a load of graduates who are 22, 23 out of university they may not be aware of really what a microaggression is. And in fact, I think somebody asked it in the chat earlier on what, what really is that. So making sure people are aware about what what is unconscious bias, what is a microaggression, what is just uh, basically things that won't be tolerated. Making sure everybody is aware of how they handle that if they do witness a situation. Um, you know, I've had a situation where we had a very junior colleague. She'd only just joined the company and we took her into a meeting with a client and the client assumed that she was the note taker. And in fact, she was a very talented data scientist. And actually in that situation, the people in the meeting room with her, were they equipped to know how to deal with that situation? She was a new employee and we had a very important client in our room. Do they know how to deal with that in a manner that is appropriate? Not just from a client perspective, not just from a, how our employee is going to um, feel about it, but in a way that actually moves the conversation forward and is positive, a positive outcome rather than a negative one. So training, awareness, education, both in terms of understanding when it does happen, but also how to deal with that situation when it does. And the final piece before I finish, um, Allies, I don't. I think this has been touched on briefly, but allies across this entire topic um, can never be undervalued. You know, it, it's one thing, and I, and I sometimes choose my moments as to when I address a chat, an issue or a situation versus when I will actually get a confidant or an ally to do it on my behalf. Because sometimes when, it, it, let's imagine something really upsets me, sometimes I am so emotionally connected to that situation that it is difficult for me to challenge in a way that drives the outcome that I want. Whereas, and therefore, you know, in those situations, if I have allies who I can say, actually, what did you think of that? How did, how do you think that made me feel? How did that make you feel? And trying to help get those allies to be part of my team to drive that change has actually been a very, very effective mechanism. Thanks, Laura. Taking training awareness, zero tolerance, getting people to feel comfortable about how they deal with it and making sure we have the right allies. I think those are four very powerful things for organizations to do and for us to do individually. I'm just going to move to Renier and ourselves. Renier, can I ask you, do you think that the microaggressions contribute to the loss of female leaders in technology teams and domain at a senior management level? And then what are your views on how we can, how, what organizations need to do to prevent that? Thanks again, Priya, for uh, bringing this one up. Um, I think much has been written about male domination of the technology world and loss of female talent in technology at senior management level. And for entry level positions, there are a lot of good initiatives that bring women into technology. But the challenge happens, in my opinion, when it comes to growing up the ladder. And I see some key measures to prevent for the loss of female talent at senior management level in the light of microaggression. First of all, hiring talent in technology is incredibly competitive nowadays. Potential senior leadership choose businesses based on the employer brand and how much they value culture, diversity, work-life balance. 
And I think by focusing on these things, you won't be missing out on hiring the best people and transform into a gender balanced way of doing business. And secondly, providing a clear career path and sponsorship for female talent is crucial to me. Having a double standard for men and women when it comes, for example, to parenting is an important obstacle for women to progress in technology. Therefore, providing, I think, a transparent and also tailored career path is essential to prevent for the loss of female talent. And thirdly, a shortage of female role models could be a barrier in showing how technology can enable women to change the world. Uh, giving females a podium when moving into more senior roles would, in my opinion, greatly contribute to closing the gap in gender contribution in senior leadership. And finally, this pandemic also represents an opportunity for us, I think. If organizations commit to build more flexible and empathic workplaces, they can retain the employees most impacted by the challenges of remote work and nurture a culture in which women have equal opportunity to achieve their potential over the long term. Over to you, Priya. And Renier, you know me, I'm not going to let you off easily. Are we doing this in our own organization? Yes, I think so. And uh, for now, we are not there yet, but we have a lot of attention for these kind of things. So. Of course, we come from a situation uh, and we are still developing as an organization, but we have a lot of attention for bringing to light what a career path could be for women in technology, having attention for having the right role models in our organization. There's certainly work to do, but I think we are on the right track uh, with any why, April. Can I, I just add something to that? Is as, as well, you know, I think, uh, and you know, everything you say, I agree with uh, strongly. I think there's a bit about um, understanding the point in which a woman's career that she starts to fall away. You know, if you if you would analyse your your people and the diversity of each of your grades and the various roles they're in, where do they fall away? You know, we know there's a very natural point at which women have a young family and who comes back to work after that. So I think, um, what, you know, in our early grades in Contexa, we have a very strong female-male ratio. Actually, you know, for, for the IT sector, it's very, very good. What we find is as we go up the organisation and we try to bring in more senior members of staff, it is considerably harder. Probably coming back to the point Rhino you made was that, you know, supporting a more balanced, um, maternity and paternity policy or childcare policy more generally so that there is more, a more equal balance and ownership between two parties. I, I think that is absolutely key. There's a certain point that women fall away and it is at the point at which they have the first, maybe not even their first, their second child when they realise having two small children, as I currently do, um, and full-time work is really, really difficult. And an organization has to lean in and actively and proactively support getting those women back into jobs, into roles that are meaningful for them, so that truthfully, being away for their, from their children is worth it. Laura, I couldn't agree more that we all need to lean in and do something about it, you know, change the work ex patterns, not be, I, mean, I, I still remember when I worked in the first consulting job, I used to work a four day week unheard of. Uh, four and a half days. I went. I, my half day was six to two and six in the morning to two in the afternoon, and then I'd go pick my son up. And people would say, you know, you're 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 working part time or you're a part timer. But you know, I was working five days a week at the client, charging the client five days a week. And some days I decided I was going to work from home on a Friday, and I would wake up early to go ride. And I had this somebody say, "You're working from." I said, "I'm working from home." He said, "Oh no, you're working from horse." And, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think you know, have, we, need, we need to stop. We need to acknowledge that people work in different ways, that contribution and that it should be measured by the value and the hours you're there or, 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 or what you're, you know, where you are, basically. I've got a couple of things have come through and Anita Kimber. Uh, I love this, Anita, radical candor. 
candor. Can we call it out in real time? We talk about dealing with microaggressions in a very calm and collected way. How do we call it out in real time? Um, and and make a, a and how do we respectfully stand up for a coworker when I see a microaggression? I'm going to ask um, Trebeni on this one, and then Laura and Ralph, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of the reaction that you have for this, right, it's not a one size that fits all. Um, it, it depends on the scenario and the context and, you know, the relationships as well. Uh, to do it respectfully, uh, depending on, again, uh, let's take an example that this is your peer colleague and uh, he or she has made that comment. And if you're a very comfortable relationship, then it is worth just highlighting that there, but it might be, again, depending on the comment itself, you might, you know, want to have that side conversation to say, hey, you said that, did you realize what that meant or, you know, how it uh, affected the other person and, you know, take it from there. So, you know, I would say that it needs to be uh, decided on the basis of the scenario occurring. And I really think, and again, you have to be a judge in terms of, you know, trying to understand, you know, what's the personality of that individual, right? Because uh, as we have already said so many times through this conversation, that it's not necessarily conscious. More often than not, it is unconscious. More often than not, it is based on stereotypes, right? So therefore, it is important to kind of try and relate in terms of, you know, where might they be coming from and then uh, decide your, uh, you know, mechanism of uh, breaking that chain or breaking in terms of, you know, helping under, uh, the individual understand that it was actually a microaggression. I'll just briefly add, Brilliant, and I mentioned Rani. it before, I, be I believe to take it in a more informal environment, if you can, go for coffee, tea, and, and have a conversation, a very um, simple, but but not in a you know closed environment where it seems very sterile and everybody's on edge. If you're in a very casual environment, like just for coffee, you would be am amazed how much it can de-arrest the individual. Uh, and hopefully that'll lead to a better relationship, a better way of working together. That's brilliant, Ralph. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious of time and um, I, I'm just gonna quickly summarize what I think I heard. So I think it's around really getting training and awareness, dealing with things in real time, but dealing with them in a manner that suits you, getting people to understand as the start of this, we said most of this was unintentional. So how do people understand the impact or, the, or, or that it's had on you? And how do you deal with that? Do you deal with that in an environment there and then, or do you, do, or you, or do you think about it and then go back and deal with it? So I think it's about calm conversations. It is about radical candor, Anita, and dealing with it. It's about organizations setting the tone from the top and carrying it through. And it's really about creating the environment and the ability for people to fe feel comfortable with that challenge, not get defensive, and get some clarity and closure and change in behavior, I think, around how we can address it through organizations. We're almost on the hour, and I think we've had two points, if I may. May I ask the audience, and you've been a fantastic audience, by the way, and we, we must go through all of these questions. They've been, they've been very spot on. So what commitments are we, as a community, going to do today, make today, to drive the right change? Whatever you think you're going to say, and whilst you're making these commitments on our, on, on, in the chat box, I'm going to ask Laura, Trebeni, Ralph, and Renier for one top tip on how to deal with it, support others, or or do something different to drive that change. Ralph, I'm gonna start with you since you're on my screen. You know what, I was gonna say, do you like what you do? Stick to it. This this is ultimately about you and, and know that you are never alone and you've got a lot of support whenever you need it, uh, formal or otherwise. Just be flat out fantastic because remember, your talent cannot be dismissed. Perfect. I love that. Trebeni, may I come to you? Sure. I would like to implore every individual listening to this today to start practicing microaffirmation. Now, microaffirmation is small gestures that each one of us can take 
to basically help recognize the efforts of others around us. It might be praising someone with tangible examples in front of others. And this is for individuals who are from different uh, minority groups, right? It's about trying to help their voices being heard in meetings or in conversations. And we can do that part. 73% of women in the workplace face microaggression, according to a McKinsey 2019 report, along with Lean in, in for women in the workplace. All of us can take this small action that can help reduce the presence of microaggressions. And it is with a positive lens when you're looking at it from a microaffirmation place. Back to you. Uh, and then Renier, if I may. I've prayed But maybe, maybe I'll I'll go. I didn't I didn't hear what you said there, Priya. Um, I think you know it, it, I think the previous two statements have been bang on. Um, a very close group of my girlfriends use a phrase which is really stable and happy, and you do the same for those who are uh, who those around you. Uh, you provide the support they need. You question, challenge. Uh, address issues as they as they appear, but more than anything, back yourself. You're in your role uh, and in your job because you're good at what you do. And if you focus on that, then uh, and um, the, then you know you you can be very very successful in spite of the subconscious unconscious bias that uh, unfortunately everybody does uh, deal with. Uh, what I would say is, you know, I I have seen things change considerably. I've uh, in the last sort of 16, 17 years of work, uh, and I've seen them change for the better. We're definitely not there yet. There's still a lot to do, but I think by us all committing uh, to that change, uh, we can continue to improve things. And I hope by the time my two-year-old and four-year-olds are my my age, then they can see how history has changed uh, over time. Thank you, Laura. I, I really agree with the, the previous points uh, mentioned. For me, it's it's about basically three things. First of all, stimulating curiosity in each other. There's, there's where it all starts for me. And second, providing a clear and appealing career path to women, all in the purpose of providing female talent with, yeah, for me, the, base, the, the best possible experience in, uh, in working in technology. Back to you, Priya. Thank you. This has been fascinating. I hope everybody's taken away as much I have uh, as much as I have from here. The next panel is in February and March. It's going to focus on neurodiversity. Your feedback is so important for us to be able to have these sessions for you so that you get some value. So please do fill in the form on the, uh, of the which will appear. But I want to say a massive thank you to Renier, to Laura, to, to Benny, and to Ralph. Thank you so much for sharing your views, for being so open and honest, and for actually tackling some of the very difficult questions that have come our way. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, uh, December and Christmas. And I hope everyone stays safe and hope to see you at the next webcast and podcast in February and March. Thanks for your time and goodbye.